Welcome, everybody, to the Tag Year It Podcast. I'm Ray Ray. I am Dave. And yes, he's uh, back on the line again, so he's at home. But hey, uh, through all this uh, mess that we've had to do, um, you know you know, what, you know, know the drill. We get him on the phone. He comes in. Uh, we have Monday Night Live here on Facebook. We post it up on the uh, podcast platforms and everything. Um, but yeah, how you doing tonight, yeah. Dave? I'm good, man. I- I'm not at my home. Oh, I'm no, actually that's right. out of Peace Valley. Peace Valley. Uh, getting make making sure that I'm ready for my logic class. Doing mm. a lot of Douglas Wilson reading and uh, some Anthony Weston reading and some Norman Geisler reading. So all good things. I'm really having a good time out here. Today was my first day out here. I got a lot done. Was able to not only get some things done in my class preparation. And it's just, uh, it's not that I'm not ready to teach. It's just that I'm wanting to make sure that I'm overly ready and uh, I'm pretty excited and I wanted to make sure that I got some time just to pour into all that content. i um, really excited for this opportunity to teach another class at Spurgeon. I'm really thankful for the opportunity to serve there and grateful for everyone who gives to the cooperative program mm. so that I can um, prepare men and women for the furtherance of the gospel and uh, proclaiming the kingdom has come. So yes. really Amen. good things. And I'm grateful, Adam, that you're allowing me to call in and uh, do this program remotely. I'll see you on Saturday and I'm yes. looking forward to that. That's going to be a great thing. Yeah. So, so speaking of that, so um, please, if you have not yet, go back to uh, last week's um, podcast that was up and then live cast go on YouTube. It's out there. Um, it looks like it's getting some uh, good views and downloads anyway. So people have already heard it. But if you have not uh, listened to that yet, um, coming up this Saturday and what I'm going to do is I'm going to make sure that I can push a button and something right happens for the <laughs> first time um, on this show. But anyway, we should. Ah, oh, we got it anyway. So if you look on the screen right now, if you're watching a lot live or on YouTube. Um, you can see the flyer, uh, the God and Government Conference, a conference on Romans 13. It is presented by Hope Baptist Church. It's Saturday, January 16th from 8 a.m. to 3 p.m. And it's hosted at or hosted by First Baptist uh, Church in Battlefield. And that is 510 State Highway FF Battlefield, Missouri. We've got the speakers, Joshua Jenkins and Brandon Dodd, who were on the show last week as we talked about um, this conference, the importance and all that kind of stuff. Um, we have Josh Eaton um, from Cross Point Baptist in Caney, Kansas. Uh, Mike Moon, um, which was, remember, a representative, HB 2285 last year. Now he is a state senator. He's going to be there. And we've got some good topics. And then Dave and I will be uh, moderating a Q&A at the very end from 2 to 3. Um, so we'll have a box out there with index cards and pins all day. Drop your questions in there. Dave and I want to test the temperature of the room to make sure that the room gets it. It's questions answered um, in a timely and good manner so that we're not having open mics or anything like that for the audience. But that is the way that uh, the audience can get their questions um, put to the panelists. So all these guys will be on a panel and Dave and I get the privilege to uh, be a part of this wonderful event anyway. So make sure Saturday, uh, January, January 16th, uh, you are out there. Um, if you go back uh, to the last show, there's the links uh, for um, the event page for the Facebook and also an RSVP link to where you can let them know that you're coming so that um, they know how many donuts and how much coffee to make. And then they're actually providing lunch. So how much food to make for lunch. Um, so we can all be there, talk to one another, commune with one another um, underneath the Lordship and authority of Jesus Christ, um, worshiping him in this way as uh, the Bible is opened up and applied to our hearts. Um, in this and there'll be psalm singing and all that stuff so it's really great it's going to be a really 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 fun event and it's so excited to do that so yeah that's the well, next time Adam, you and me will see I each other say real quick yeah 
we are planning on giving away some apologetics plaques, right? Yeah, as we got many as we have. Yeah, and right? one thing that I thought about, um, I do have an extra copy of uh, Rob Phillips, um, whatever sh Christians should know about the Trinity, um, being the starting point of everything and all this law talk, Romans 13 and everything. I thought it might be a cool uh, thing to do is if you come to the conference um, and you have not liked uh, the Facebook page of Tag Your It, um, anybody that would uh, follow us on Facebook or subscribe to us on YouTube or uh, subscribe to us, you know, on, on a uh, podcast platform and let us know, um, we'll enter you into a drawing for that book. That'd be kind yeah, of a cool Yeah, and I think on too. the plaques, what we'll do is if you can just show us that you've liked us on Facebook mm -hmm. or or subscribe to us on YouTube. We'll give you a plaque as well. Yeah, we got some and cool so, plaques and, yeah, from the ApolloCon a long, long and, time ago. Yeah, and we will have some of our books for sale there, right, until we run out. Isn't that correct? Yeah, well, we've got uh, some Show Me Wise, and we've got some... Uh, or the uh, the word snatchers as well. Yeah. So we, we've got lots of stuff. We can be cool and, uh, you know, do stuff like that anyway. So we'll work on that during the week <laughs> to get yeah. prepared. Yeah, well, it'll for be that. great. I, I yeah. like all those things, Adam. I think that's good stuff. I'm looking forward to being there and serving on the Q&A panel with you and beside you. It'll be fun. It'll be neat to meet some folks and hopefully um, get some individuals to like and to subscribe to the podcast. We, yeah, as long again, as we can, this is, as long as we can stay on here anyway. <laughs> yeah, and the the great yeah. thing I can say is, hey, praise the Lord! I know last week was the first show of 2021. Yes, but now I can officially say that I've been podcasting with you for five years. Yeah. Once this program Somewhere. goes out, so well, actually, it's uh, four cool. years. We're on our fifth year. We're that's, on our fifth yeah, year. Yeah, we're on yes. our fifth year. We're, so we we're in the fifth calendar yeah. year. Yes, yes. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> how, so, how time yeah. works. And we'll then that's we'll how you harmonize time in the Gospels, by the way. But anyway, that's uh, neither <laughs> here nor there. Not this show, not this topic. <laughs> that's right. So, uh, yeah, tonight we wanted to uh, deal. Uh, we could probably go a little bit extra long, maybe turn this into two episodes. Who knows? Let's just go with it. We're sort of winging this one. Um, we did. We have not planned all week um, for this show. This is kind of a not, not necessarily a hodgepodge. Oh, I don't know what happened there, but I'm getting something weird in my ears. I knew some little demons would show up. But anyway, but yeah, the meme theology song uh, just started playing. But anyway, um, I didn't hear it from this side, Adam. So <laughs> that's good. Uh, you know, that's good. Good stuff, but, man. <laughs> <laughs> that just uh, surprised me. I thought I thought I had everything muted that needed to be muted. But anyway, um, two topics today. Um, we wanted to get to, and uh, I guess the first topic is. Um, really in light of this conference we're getting ready to come up and uh, go to and talk about and we'll end up recapping. So I'll have another show uh, on that. Um, just kind of geared up, uh, getting into the right mindset um, of why it's important, what's going on out there, um, especially uh, dealing with this apologetically. Um, just thinking about a uh, past um I, I've heard it um, multiple times. I've seen uh, Facebook posts multiple times, kind of with the same spirit and everything. Um, but just want to sort of an answer an objection to theonomy um, that, you know, God's law, theon, theos and nomos, God's law, theonomy. And um, so that's what I wanted to do. I wanted to, you know, we wanted to get a little bit more biblical um, this year as far as, you know, presenting and reading and exegeting scripture. So um, let's do it tonight, Dave. Why don't you say I that? love it, man. Yeah. I'm excited. Yeah. I I appreciate the conversation we had this morning, and mm -hmm. uh, I thought that, that was a good way to get us going into what we had today. There was so many things that were prevalent last week mm -hmm. that demanded some type of attentive response. Yeah. And I don't post a lot on Facebook, and so the opportunity and the mechanism by which I really try to speak into those things is. Is first and foremost the pulpit. You know, I do think that we need to be preaching into the culture. I, I love uh, what has been stated by numerous theologians. Um, I think specifically of, of Trevin Wax actually stating very clearly in my mind uh, yeah. in the apologetic, in the worldview study Bible, where he says, you know, we read the bible to know how to read the newspaper and so yeah. i do think that even this topic that we're jumping into is not just a exegete of scripture but it's demonstrating how you read the bible to speak into the church about the culture 
Yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, uh, you know, when we're talking about culture, what are people culturally saying? And uh, that's what I wanted to deal with tonight. Cause uh, you know, there's a one message that was sent to me after um, I had, we had started the Missouri Baptist Apollo or the, the Missouri Baptist for the abolition of abortion page. I sent out a bunch of invites to like that page and I'd gotten a response back to why they could not join me. Um, you know, join us in that, um, venture being a Christian still and all that kind of stuff. And just kind of laying out a few things. I replied back to him and, uh, got a little bit of a reply back and uh, try to see if I can get invite him into a conversation anyway, but uh, sort of want to utilize that. Um, I went on Facebook and also just kind of just get some recent uh, mining anyway of, uh, of, of just kind of like what's out there on Facebook. Cause there's a lot of posts that, you know, out there that you can search or whatnot to kind of get the, the spirit of it. And I put this uh, Bible uh, verse into there and i you know came up with another uh another example of uh why we need to talk about this but anyway on the bible uh passage but the bible verse anyway that we'll be dealing with if um you guys uh look into first corinthians um we'll you know be in five um or chapter five and six tonight um but there is a key verse here um that uh is util is sometimes um from people if uh they want to have a knee jerk um sort of saying anyway to speak against uh the law or god's law and being i i guess it's not necessarily a direct it's an indirect attack at a th- theonomy anyway it's sort of a peripheral uh argument um but um whenever we talk about how um god's law is still in place and active today and that people are judged by it. And, uh, you know, whenever we talk about abortion, um, we want the civil magistrate to treat it as murder and to try people for murder. If it's premeditated or whatever, um, you know, that it should be tried as murder. And if it's truly the case, then you suffer the penalty for murder. Anyway, they would say, ho, 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 wait a second. Paul said, and if you look in uh, chapter five, verse 12, for what business is it of mine? to judge outsiders. And so they, yeah. you know, that's sort of been a, I, I've seen that in a few spots. And um, whenever you think of that verse, think of that verse and then think of what people say, you can kind of sort of relate um, to what's going on there. Um, well, even, yeah. even at the Missouri Baptist annual meeting this year, that was one of the first things that people brought yes. against our statement was, wait a second, we can't do that. And to that, just I'm sorry if I'm taking the segue here, but to that, my statement is what is more terrible to reject God's law and his holiness? Because his law is, of course, pointing towards his holiness or to say people are guilty of murder because he said that I'm going to embrace God's law, not trying to make some person happy. What's more compassionate? Well, wait a second. What's your standard of compassion? Yeah. Upholding what God says is right or upholding what you feel is the nicer thing to do. Yeah. Yeah. And so, yeah, that, that's that's where the rubber meets the road. You know, which master are you going to serve? Mm-hmm. Um, are you going to be embarrassed by God's word? Which, I mean, if you're at the Missouri Baptist Convention in a room full of people, and we're all gathered there for the gospel, the Great Commission. Um, if you're embarrassed of God's word, you have to be embarrassed at the Great Commission. You can't just uh, parts and piece this stuff out. Um, you know, unless if you have a really good argument on discontinuity, again, we have to talk covenantally, which I don't know. The, the sad fact is, is in Baptist life, um, we've lost that. Um, to dispensationalism, which sharply uh, just closes things off that are not closed off in scripture. And that's the, the, that's the debate really, (laughs) you know? Um, Yeah. And, but uh, you know, whenever we consider this uh, attitude, you know, here's uh, just, just a little, just a message, no names or anything. And there is nothing, um, you know, there's no malice or anything that I have. Here's an opportunity that was presented that could cause a, uh, a higher brotherhood, a uh, higher fellowship um, between uh, me and this fellow uh, that messaged yeah. me anyway. But anyway, I just want to read it. it says, thanks for the invite. And I'm declining, declining. I love your Christian faith and I like the apologetic approach you share. I am a huge uh, believer, yet I am a liberal, which is the first issue. 
to deal with um because he's yeah. identifying as a liberal not you know or i mean you could say maybe christian liberal but now you're adding something to your christianity that you'd have to go is it is is the liberal position jesus's position or not or is it just well something he's you assuming the to? one that you would yeah. know what there is some type of consistent liberal definition which i would say if you're truly a liberal then you would actually if you're going to be consistent you would reject the ability to have a universally understood definition for that terminology by the way yeah if yeah. you're truly going to internally critique that worldview that's the problem words yeah. don't have meaning so what did you mean well he obviously demonstrated he couldn't be consistent with his position yeah, yeah sorry that's the, that's the thing and he's, even paul um you know uh another place i guess uh, in corinthians <laughs> he's talking about divisions among you <laughs> and uh <laughs> you know you know one says he, we could just equate it one says he's a republican one says he's a democrat one says he's a libertarian you know you're all gods right uh, so that's 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 the first issue but he says though i will not have an abortion i am pro-choice for other reasons i am very much pro education and information yet completely uh banning i am not for it sorry um so he's not sorry for uh not wanting to uh abolish abortion he says hope this doesn't yeah. change your opinions of me and it's one of those things that um knowing this person knowing uh the groups they are with um, I already knew this. Um, whenever he messaged me about this kind of a thing, I, it's already in my mind. So it's I, not that I think any lesser of him. And I did say, here's error and all that kind of stuff. We don't have to go through um, my reply back to them. But, you know, I just wanted to get back um, to what he says after they says, uh, thanks. And I do appreciate it. I do feel um, I have an interpretation of the Bible that helps me become sanctified. Um, I most certainly use the Bible as a mirror and not a billboard. I don't cuss. I don't drink. I don't have an abortion or plan of being uh, with a man as abortion or plan on being with a man as well as countless other things um, to get closer to you. So now we're seeing um, his interpretation of the Bible says helps him become sanctified. But then what, what concerns me is, is I don't, cuss i don't drink i don't have an abortion or plan on being with a man so it's i'm following all this law so mm. i'm being set apart by law it works for me um so again there's no gospel talk here um, yes. he says I, I as well as all these uh, countless other things that i use to get closer to god um so he's using the law to get closer to god um all that aside, I sin daily because I'm human. I'm given a daily reprieve. I just don't well, want to Well, wait a be, second. Yeah. I want to stop real yeah. quick, Adam. I know we haven't yeah. jumped into the text, but like yeah. this gentleman's statement, and I mean this with, with all due respect and all charity that I can muster, he just laid out some objective statements that he believed, as you pointed out, mm -hmm. are somehow interconnected with law. He yeah. is saying, don't use words that are going to defile me, yeah. right? Yeah. Or don't use words that demonstrate the, the filthy, filthiness of my heart. Yeah. Don't. And when he says drink, I'm assuming he means don't be given over to drunkenness. Like, I, I assume that's where he is. And maybe he's saying, well, hey, don't touch alcohol at all. Okay, those are certainly positions that I think convictionally a person can have. Hey, don't ever touch alcohol. I'm not against anyone who says that right now. If they say, well, no one should ever drink because that's going to sin. I think that they're, again, being a little arbitrary there. But, but I'm reading it as he's saying, don't don't get drunk. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Well, Just you know, he's, he's not. Far. Yeah. He's not doing these kind of things. But in nowhere like in here, does he mention, be, you know, the salvation? He's just going. I have an interpretation of the Bible um, that leads me to follow law but he doesn't exactly. say what is that what is in that are you following the law because you love jesus are you following the law because you feel better uh, that's is he following himself or is he following uh jesus but then is, is he the makes key. another but, yeah. statement that's very yeah, this universal is the big one. yeah Share his that. universal statement is i sin daily because i am human yeah and uh yeah there's a very serious issue. How do you know that that is true? Yeah. You've made mm -hmm. a universal about everyone. All, you, you've said 
you've implied very clearly mm. that all human beings are sinful. Mm-hmm. How do you know that? How do you know that? What is sin? Yeah. Is it the same Again, way that you know that uh, abortion is murder? Exactly. That's, that's the thing. And, and so he goes, it goes on ahead and it says, and here's the big issue. It says, I just don't want to be a stumbling block by forcing laws on people that might not be ready for that in their life. So you have to be ready uh, mm. in your life to not murder babies. Apparently. That was what Paul was always after and Christ was always after when they proclaimed the good news. Yeah. So you're not ready for the gospel. You're not ready for, for the, the kingdom of God yet. So the laws of murder can be suspended for you. That's, that is a major problem. Oh yeah. So sorry, um, go ahead and continue there. But yeah, he says, uh, knowing you're an apologist, uh, prove you come, you know, Knowing that you're an apologist, this is where the text kind of gets a little weird, but um, you come from prepared for all arguments. I would be coming from a concept of love and tolerance to get to know and grow a friendship. Um, Now I'm a terrible typist, so I won't go on with you. Love you, brother. Can't wait for an opportunity to meet. So sometime we need, I need to meet with this guy, um, you know, but, but, and, and, but he goes to a church that should be teaching that uh, tolerance is a myth. It's a false truce as Douglas Wilson put out a really good podcast about um, on the uh, blog and may blog anyway, but tolerance is a, you know, this is neutrality. There's no neutrality. It's murder and you should be defending against murder. Like we, we want to defend against uh, the unjust killing of black people, Asian people, whatever right now, but not babies. So we're being arbitrary about, murder and you know the thing is is like to be a stumbling block by calling the world to god's law that is kind of a scary thing to think about that this person hasn't been taught that god's law is good paul says god's law is good and it's good if it's used lawfully that's right be using it lawfully to stop the murder of babies or at least criminalize again and we're not naive it's not going to stop people are still sinful people don't want babies because they would rather have careers in hollywood or whatever they would rather sacrifice a life for that if they made bad decisions that you know scientifically they know how abortion works right so um here's where it gets down to uh brass tacks you know uh, i guess just another um image here just to you know get back into the text um yeah. that i saw um just kind of the spirit of the age anyway there's another person um that said had a nice reminder in my scripture reading today that the church is not called to judge those outside the church we cannot and should not expect non-believers to hold the same values and the same beliefs as we do to do that would be irrational sadly um there are many who are acting irrationally these days uh by these standards including myself at times remember believer you are called to share the good news with the world um god will take care of the rest and there is some truth in here um but yes. the, then again there's going to be something back of how i'm going to read this totally different than a lot of people especially uh people in bigger churches <laughs> around here <laughs> <laughs> if i were going to say that anyway but um let's get back into the text here um so yeah well let me real yeah, quick before yeah, we do before. i want to state one thing notice a few elements there is a grain of truth in there where we say we cannot expect non-believers to hold the same values that we do. Agreed. But God expects all humanity to submit to the authority of his word. And therefore, the good news is he has demonstrated in Christ Jesus that he can hold us accountable to his word. Through yeah. the imputation of Christ's righteousness and the imputation of our sins upon Christ, which he willingly took, and the consequences of being lawbreakers. Yeah. And so that statement, and I love how Van Til says it, there's only two types of people. Those are lawbreakers and law keepers. Yeah, those and are on our own, in Christ. That's right. In Adam or in Christ. And we are all lawbreakers, but in Christ we can become law keepers because mm. 
Christ has imputed his righteousness on us. But yeah. even to make statement that there is good news, what is it good news about? Yeah. If we're going to share the good news, what is the first thing that we have to say? We have to say well, that we've there is a, a standard while. by which to there yeah. is a standard by which to evaluate those people who are outside of Christ against. And yeah. so this is a self refuting statement. And of course she's believing that she's saying something great. Uh, she's not, she's saying something incredibly foolish when you break it down. Yeah. Sorry, yeah. Adam. Oh no, that's fine. And I know that we're probably having some live issues right now, just uh, for you live guys oh. that can maybe still hear this. Sorry about this. I'm not sure. I'm just going to let my computer do its thing, but Hey, it's available for podcast consumption. It'll be up in the morning. <laughs> Uh, for you live guys now it'll be up in the morning for you podcast guys you're hearing it now <laughs> thank you so much so, adam for doing all that yeah, hard work yeah man. yeah there's Appreciate some it. going on on the internet issues or whatever um but we will move we will move on because we are still recording on the other computer so got a couple universes right. here amen so but yeah so you know the gospel we got to realize um simply stated the gospel presupposes the law if you have not the law you do not have the gospel um amen. we cannot divorce them um you can be you can be divorced from the curse of the law because not necessarily not because god winks at you as we've discussed on the show before christ does not just dismiss the charges he took and absorbed what you deserve he took the charges of yours on himself became sin knew who knew no sin so that we could be the righteousness of god and that is the gospel the gospel is nothing without the law and what is the law that's uh, a lot of people will end up all well, just uh, it's the law of Christ. Well, you're still saying a universal statement and nothing particular. So you're still talking about nothing. So yeah. there must be particulars here. And so the only law that we have in the scriptures is the law that reflects God, his Amen. moral law. And then really, whenever we get down to it uh, on the civil side, there is civil law because it's God's moral law worked out socially. That's yes. what justice should be based on <laughs> so uh, that being said you know so we're let's get back to uh, uh five here so verses uh nine through um five five nine through six one is basically the passage um when you read the bible don't just take a verse but where's that verse located read the passage is there something more to add to the context read the whole book and then read it in light of the whole of scripture all 66 books um, to to bring clarity, scripture interprets scripture. So let's uh, get back on here. It says, "I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sex, um, sexual immora, um, uh, uh, sexually immoral people." Um, so basically, if you go up, you're going to talk about uh, there is actually members in the church who are involved in sexual immorality. So that's the context. But I'm jumping to nine four. Um, our purpose is here. I wrote to you in a letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean the immoral people of this world or greedy and swindlers or idolaters. Otherwise, you would have to leave the world. But actually, I wrote you not to associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister, a fellow Christian here, um, and, and is sexually immortal, immoral or greedy or an idolater or verbally abusive, a drunkard or a swindler. Do not even eat with such a person. So don't bring these people into your home, right? He says, for what business is it of mine to judge outsiders? Don't you judge, um, don't you judge those who are inside? God judges outsiders remove the evil person from among you. And he says, if any of you, and this is chapter six, if any of you has a dispute against another, how dare you take your, uh, take it to court before the unrighteous and not before the saints? Or do you know that the, that the saints will judge the world? Or don't you know that the saints will, will judge the world? So there is a judgment of, from the oh. saints over the world here. So if you keep reading, and if the world is judged by you, are you unworthy to judge the trivial cases? Don't you know that we will judge angels? How much more matters of this life? So if you have such matters, do you appoint as your judges those who have no standing in the church? I say this to your shame. Can it be that there is not one wise person among you who is able to arbitrate between fellow believers? Instead, brother goes to court against brother, and that before unbelievers. 
As it is, to have legal disputes against one another is already a defeat for you. Why not rather be wronged? Why not rather be cheated? Instead, you yourselves do wrong and cheat, and you do this to brothers and sisters. And we can really end there um, for our purposes. Yeah. Um, but so, what is the problem well, Essentially, now? yeah, uh, at least as I read it, what I see, Adam, just jumping out to me first, and I'm going to let you do some more contextual stuff because I know you've done all more homework on some of that, but there is this idea of why is the church going to the civil magistrate to get arguments settled between them when the church should be judging itself and taking care of itself within its walls? Yeah, yeah. That's the point, not saying you shouldn't judge those who are outside of the church as guilty of sin. All right. There you yeah, go. yeah. Oh. So yeah, that, that's the issue. And so really this establishes the ideas of theonomy. Mm. This establishes them because this is saying there is a sphere of government in the church institution that you should be judging these things. And then what we know from other scriptures is that we are to forgive one another because Christ has forgiven us. So there yeah. is a sphere. So this only establishes the fact that there is, you are supposed to be self-ruled, not autonomous, but self-ruled, not self-lawed. And then you are, you have a family sphere of government with the husband as the head. And then you have the church sphere of government with elders and deacons and you have the congregation and they all have responsibilities and duties. And then you have the civil magistrate, the civil government, um, and they're all underneath God. They are all underneath right. Christ. So if we're going to be great commission Christians, if we believe the great commission, which I would say to be a Christian, if you do not believe the great commission, then you're, I'm going to have to be like, if you, if you don't take that as the <laughs> truth, uh, you are kidding yourself. You are fooling yourself. You are deceived. I want better for the person that would believe that. Um, but their response to me would be where I would have to go. You're not really a Christian. Um, because he says all authority in heaven on earth has been given to me. Um, Colossians um, 2, right? Or Colossians yeah. 1 talks about how he all thrones and dominions are his. And then also right. the church. <laughs> he is the head also of the church. So he is as well as the thrones and dominions of the world. He is also the head of the church. And so what we need to realize is whenever we're talking about judgment here, like that, uh, um, last, uh, thing that I talked about, you know, that, um, the church is not called to judge those outside the church. I can read that as like, well, yeah, we are, we don't have a court for outside the church people, but we do have a court right. for the inside. Um, we cannot and should not expect not unbelievers to have the same values. So here's what is called equivocation. So if you know logic, and logical principles which reflect the mind of God and that we after him also are reasonable and we account for logic in the triune God here. Um, this is a, an equivocation. This is a judgment, like a mind discernment sort of judgment. And this is, this is saying we're not supposed to do that. We should expect them to act like sinners and everything. We shouldn't judge them. No, no, no. This is a reason why I can read this and get most, a lot of truth out of this last one is the fact that I know the distinction, but this is not making, this is equivocating terms that um, we don't judge. No, we need to judge because we need to see who is not a believer so we can preach the gospel to them and bring them in to be brothers That's and right. sisters with us. Right. Um, so if we don't judge, then we don't evangelize, simply put. And uh, that's not the Great Commission. <laughs> We've been told yes. to, to, to proclaim the gospel to the nations, baptizing and teaching the instructions of Jesus Christ and them obeying those instructions and commands. And so there's well, an equivocation here, and that's, a, that's, yeah. that's what happens. And to kind of springboard off of that, here is where the major issue comes within our culture. Because the church is not enforcing things like church discipline or even holding people who call themselves part of the body under the revelation of Christ, under the revelation of God, 
under the reality that God is creator and therefore sets a standard because we fail to enforce that check against people in the church, we're unable to have any means to speak truth into the culture itself. Does that make sense? Oh yeah, for sure. And so at the point where we quit using the law as a standard by which to measure the actions within the church, we have no voice to speak outside of the church. We will always be, and I love that those words of Paul, a stumbling block to our culture when we're actually living out the gospel because we can judge. Mm. In fact, as Christ says in John 3, Guess what? Unbelievers are already under condemnation. That means they're already under God's judgment. But yeah. when we stop and jump from inside of the walls of the church and just start blatantly throwing out uh, large generalizations against the culture, they mean nothing because we've not enforced those same standards within the church. And, and Paul is pointing to that as exceptionally problematic Right, that instead of going inside of the walls of the church to get judgment, we're actually jumping out to the civil magistrate to make that judgment when they themselves don't even have a standard of justice that is uh, held captive to the law of God. Yeah, yeah, and so that's that's the issue here. Is like you know in that last uh, um, again that last little Facebook uh, quote, um, that Facebook mind quote. Anyway, um, it says that. you know, they, they, God will take care of the rest. And this is where Romans 13 comes in. Yes. It's prescriptive. It says that the, uh, the, that they are the deacon, the servant of God. And I've, I, let me turn over there um, because I think even um, I've had this uh, recently come up and had to comment on something with Austin Peterson and tell him to uh, talk with uh, Jeff Durbin again. <laughs> it's something that he was wanting <laughs> an article he was supporting that I was like that, that basically had totally isogeted um, scripture. But then again, I don't think the person that wrote it was a Christian anyway, but was appealing to um, because Austin Peterson does that as well as uh, a, appeals to Christianity because they were growing up in it and they have to appeal to guys like Dave and I for their support (laughs) anyway. But yes, we get Romans 13. Um, You know, it's, it's, it is God's servant for an Avenger or an Avenger that brings wrath on the one who does wrong. Um, So we're not supposed to avenge ourselves. Um, So this is 1219 friends do not avenge yourselves. Instead leave room for God's wrath. So God will take care of the rest, but guess what? He's established something that is to do God's wrath. It says, um, leave room for God's wrath. And you get into uh, 13, it says it is the servant, the government. We're supposed to submit to governing authorities since there's no authority except from God and the authorities that exist are instituted by God. So then one who resists the authority is opposing God's command and those who oppose it will bring judgment on themselves for rulers are not a terror to good conduct, but to bad. Do you want to be unafraid of authority? Do what is good and you will have its approval for it is God's servant for your good. It is God's servant for your good. But if you do wrong, be afraid because it does not carry the sword for no reason, for it is God's servant and avenger that brings the wrath on the one who does wrong. Therefore, you must submit not only because of wrath, but also because of your conscience. So this includes both believers and unbelievers in that sense, too, the ones who are thinking. Um, And for this reason, you pay taxes since the authorities are God's servants continually attending to these tasks, pay your obligation. So we're going to say prescriptively, this isn't just talking about the people that he's talking to um, as far as, um, Oh, I guess you could say as far as the people to submit, it's actually telling the government, Hey, you are my servant. Now what That's standard right. whenever uh, you go back to Israel, um, whenever all the nations around Israel were judged, did God have two standards then was he judging the land of Canaan? Um, that he was handing over to the Israelites, was he judging them by a different standard? No. Is God double-minded? That's the question you got to ask yourself on this. So, by what standard is the government supposed to be God's deacon? 
what by what standard is is the sword wield against on evil what is good what is evil and so this is a prescriptive passage this is why it's important to go to a conference like we're having saturday so you know so the the tale of the two problems i guess we can get into that <laughs> this is yeah. going to be one long episode because <laughs> we we had to hit hit a lot of things yeah. anyway well no i think that we've done a good job of laying that out and i think that that's really important that the mindset, the string of mindset, you know, the way that these arguments are building upon one another are really important for the conclusion yeah. or for uh, what I believe is uh, the, the the main argument that we're making. Yeah, yeah. So, um, you know, so the title of, of the show anyway, at least this topic was, you know, a, a tale of two problems. Um, those two problems are uh, the pietistic social retreatism and um and this is uh, given uh, a term that i found in a, an article from joseph boot called churchianity or christianity the need for scriptural cultural theology um i download or i uh, printed it off it's like 31 pages right here it's totally worth having reading and having underlying studying and then going to scriptures and uh having a good time Anyway, so it's it's that's a problem, and then also the social gospel is the problem, yes. and that's something that you and me have talked about, you know, and and a lot of us uh, similar podcasters. That's something that we can't get off of because it is the curtain issue, it's the culture wars, all that kind of stuff, and really, you know, the social gospel is even closer to home because it's people um, who are aping Christianity, stealing our terminology, stealing the Bible, and liberalizing it and parts and piecing it out for their purposes. Um, but then blaming the conservative side. I'm, if if, I, if you want to label me conservative, label me conservative. But um, you know, I'll just say uh, the the distinction I would say is no. I'm a theonomist. I believe in God's yes. law, um, which does have social implications. <laughs> yeah, that have been lacking in the church, and I'll totally admit that. That's why we have a podcast like this. Amen. So anyway, uh -huh. yeah, yeah, go for it. No, 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 you go for it, man. Oh, no, I was just going get, to get right into this. So, you know, so whenever we uh, take take the uh, term um, or the pietistic social retreatism, um, that's a new term to you, I'm sure. Um, you know, so let's we, we've got to define it. But I think uh, we just did um, with what we were talking about, you know, people that um, they go to church, they hear they hear. Uh, the things read, they believe certain things read, they read the Bible. Um, I don't know if they know how to study the Bible. Apparently they don't. And it demonstrates it. We demonstrated it just by kind of deconstructing those um, few ideas anyway, that uh, there, there are definitely um, Bible study issues. Um, are they studying the Bible just by what they feel? Are they opening up the Bible, fanning out the pages and pointing and, you know, I'll look at this verse today and think about it, you know, just kind of out of context or are they, really studying the Bible for context. Are they, are there preachers preaching the gospel in context and preaching the Bible in context? Um, if they are, then these people aren't listening or they're not. And these people don't have food to eat. Yeah. And that's why they are. Um, but when we're talking about this uh, socialist or these uh, pietistic social retreatism, it's one of the is one side of an issue in the church um, that Joseph boot in his article talks about. And um, so he says, um, that uh, there, so I'm just going to go through the article just with what I have underlined. It says, um, um, it should come to as no surprise that something is amiss amongst modern evangelical churches, whether Reformed, Charismatic, Pentecostal, Baptist, or any other stripe. Um, they are not providing an adequate or consistent response to the challenges of an increasingly anti-Christian culture. Um, this goes on to say leaders seem to leaders seem poorly prepared to equip God's people in the face of pre, of the pressing tax of applying biblical truth to all of life, um, often in a host, hostile context. So the message of the gospel is that Jesus Christ is king over all the earth, over all cultures and peoples and lands. And this again goes back to Matthew twenty eight eighteen through twenty, the Great Commission. Um, so he says there's there's two different differing responses, um, but they have common root problems. Um, so yes. this first one is um, described as those who greatly overrate the place and role of the institutional church and its offices, 
neglecting and even rejecting the idea of other spheres, institutions, and forms of cultural life um, are realms um, subject to God's word. And the second one is those who greatly overrate the role of the state or political life in general and its responsibilities and functioning or functions and working out the kingdom purposes of God in history. So, you know, here, here's, here's one, the, the, uh, the, uh, pietists for short, the pietists, uh, problem here is, uh, they overrate the place of the church and then the social gospel highly overrates the role of the state. So again, we just established just from talking about first Corinthians. And I mean, there's multiplicity of places in scripture where we can do the same thing, but from this, uh, what we just talked about, we have established spheres. There's a church sphere. There's a civil sphere. And so yes. one of them is over and they work together via Romans 13 that we talked about here. Um, there is a purpose for all the, for all these spheres. Um, but uh, you know, we got a problem because one exalts itself over the other or even um, abolishes the others. <laughs> and so that's the problem. So pietists are the ecclesiocracy, I guess, people, and then yes. you've got the tyranny of the social gospel <laughs> Yes, when you get down to it. Well, and again, I think it comes down to a point, and I, and I think you've been kind of hitting on that, and we discussed this a little bit before, this concept that you can separate the uh, sacred and you can separate the non-sacred. Yeah. Uh, you can say my faith is a personal issue and i live my faith out or and i and 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 i will separate that from my public uh, office right? right if you're a politician yeah what yeah. you see in that is this moralistic uh more this elevation of the moralistic principles where you're essentially trying to live by at least what you would say uh, privately a set of moral principles that you're not going to apply in the public realm. You're not going to advocate for your moral principles outside of uh, how they apply to you specifically. Yeah, yeah. And then you have a idea where uh, we're going to live out our moral principles and we're going to bring about cultural reform by voting our morals into yeah. power and that would be the way the, that's the way that i would nuance that yeah um if that makes any sense yeah. and those are two massively problematic issues that we actually see clashing very much mm -hmm. uh but likewise, the church is not developing people who actually see the sacred and the secular as one and the same. There is no secular. Yeah. There yeah. is only the sacred. Yeah. And that's, that uh, is the, yeah. And that's, go for it. that's one of the, that's the, I think the, the, I guess that would be like the fundamental root problem um, that in this article that Joseph Boot put out, um, he kind of, I guess, maybe argues from the weakest to the strongest <laughs> um, yeah. in this. Um, but uh, the third problem that he says here is that um, both of them, so this isn't just the, the, the pietist, this is also the social gospel, both of them. The root problem is, is, is an implicit and destructive dualism that slices up reality into matter and spirit, nature and grace, sec secular and sacred, natural and supernatural, time and eternity, higher and lower, um, with one area perceived as lesser or evil and the other as higher and good. And that is Gnosticism. And you wonder why. You wonder why Vadi Bakken comes out and uses the language that he does. He says that, uh, you know, this, the social gospel, um, this critical race theory and all that stuff, it is ethnic Gnosticism. Well, and it comes down to this, and, and this is the very, this is the lived experience that I believe individuals who are consistently Christian are going to have to face more and more. We have been gravitating so strongly towards this idea of social justice, but we've been allowing the world to define what justice is. We've, yeah. in, we've invited 
society to be the arbiter of justice and then measured ourselves according to that idea. Yeah. See, what the problem is, is the, and, 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 and Vody Bauckham says it, the social, social justice is neither social nor is it justice. Yeah. Right. Uh, because why would I say that? Well, because what is society as defined by Christ? Well, it, it's composed of two people. Uh, the, uh, those who are in Adam and those who are in Christ. So if I la- allow those who are in Adam to define what justice is and even the constraints of how society should uh, be the ones who are arbit- arbitrary defining what justice is, I have no justice mm-hmm. because there's always going to be an arbitrary line that they're using to define what justice is rather than the revelational line that God has created. Yeah. For the, so for the Christian, social justice is, is not, it shouldn't be a, even in our lexicon. It's biblical justice. Yeah. And that's yeah. always going to be at an antipathy uh, and, and again, antithetical to what society, those who are in Adam, define as justice. Yeah. And so Christians can't be like, oh, we're pro-social justice. This. Why? Because you've now given the foundation, you've given the battle over to those who are in Adam, and therefore you've allowed them to define what is justice. Yeah. And so we can't placate towards that. And so with those two dichotomies, those who are going to say, you know what, the, the sacred and the secular, I'll keep my uh, sacred with me. And, and, and I'll, I'll separate that from the secular. They're going to allow the secular to define what justice is always. Yeah. And yeah. then to those who think they're going to shift the culture through uh, voting in the voting booth, uh, they likewise are not looking to what redemption is. They're not looking to any type of, uh, again, godly version of what it means to create cultural change. They're allowing what they would say is, oh, we're going to let, we're going to let our magistrates that are secular be the ones who are um, carrying out justice. They've now created a a position where the non-believing magistrate is now carrying out what they're going to, to call justice. And that gives the tools, not to them, but it gives the, it gives the tools to them, which they're ill-equipped to do. It's handed what the church should be doing over to the secular culture. Yeah, um, yeah. And, the, and the, you know, the big issue is, you know, when it, you can't, you just can't get around scripture and uh, like and the, and the history that happened after the ascension and after Pentecost, um, even with Paul, you know, in Acts 17 is a place that we go to, uh, you know, with apologetics and talking about Paul at Athens. But, you know, even even before then, uh, you know, Paul um, in the same chapter of Acts um, talks about uh, Jason. And something um, was re- was was uh, unique in what was talked about uh, with the whole situation with with Jason's household um, in that chapter. As I'm turning to it here real quick, and uh, you know, it says uh, this is interesting. Do do we um, need to affect culture? I think we have enough in Jesus' words to go and make disciples of all nations. Um, baptizing them right i think we have enough but do you need more um and we do have again a lot more and if we look at um act 17 um i think it's right here after they passed through uh, Amphipolis and apollonia they came to thessalonica there was a jewish synagogue as usual paul went into the synagogue and on the third on three sabbath days reasoned with them from the scriptures explaining and proving that it was necessary for the Messiah to suffer and rise from the dead. This Jesus I am proclaiming to you is the Messiah. Um, Some of them were persecuted and joined Paul and Silas, including a large number of God-fearing Greeks and as well as a number of leading women. Um, But then what happens here? But the Jews became jealous and they brought together some wicked men from the marketplace, formed a mob and started to riot in the city, attacking Jason's house. And they searched for them to bring them out into public assembly. Um, when they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of his brothers before the city officials, shouting, "These men who have turned these men who have turned the world upside down have come here too." 
so they recognize something about what's going on here. This is culture That's changing right. people. The Jews are mad about the culture change. And so it's not just about old covenant days being done away with, which eventually we know happened in 70 AD, but it was, he brought them in front of the city officials and had to tell the city officials they're turning the world upside down. So you should care about this too, because why, why city officials should you care about this too? It's because this has implications to change cultures. That's right. And that's why, <laughs> you know, so again, what more do I, do I need, do I need to like to do a trifecta of three just, just to establish, I guess, does it have, can the Bible say something once? <laughs> if that's not sufficient, then I understand that we can get into um, some fun uh, grammatical sort of things and talk about how in the old Testament they used threes to establish something really big, but we don't need that now. <laughs> we can, we have Christ word. We have, um, this is history written um, to us to read about uh, Paul's, well, and, um, you know, going out and, and um, building churches and building culture. And real quick, I think you left out that next verse. And I yeah. think that that's yeah. even more, oh, yeah. uh, just as important. Jason and Jason has received well, them and they are acting against the decree of Caesar saying yeah. there is another, another king, king Jesus. Mm -hmm. What did that mean to the Jews? It meant that the new Testament Christians were saying there's a higher moral standard than that, which is set by Caesar. Yeah. There's a higher authority. Than that, And the Jews knew exactly what they were saying with that. Mm -hmm. They knew that if this Jesus was really the Messiah, guess what? He was the lawgiver, the ultimate authority of lawgiver to these folks. And therefore, that standard that they were going to submit to held a higher place in their life. That's what turned the world upside down. Yeah. And so you it know, wasn't that go for it. And, and so, so why the social gospel? That's, that's kind of where I was going. Why, why on the flip side, you know, from this, uh, cause like, I mean, right now we're definitely hitting the, uh, the retreatist, the pietistic treatise retreatist person here. Um, but the one thing is, is I'm going to have to say it's because of the retreatism, why we're dealing with exactly what we're dealing with today is because we have not held people to their standards that they are underneath um, especially the civil magistrate, we have not, we have not evangelized them. We yes. have not produced them in our churches. That is the sphere of the church to teach. And then the civil sphere is the one to deal with only what retribution issues and restitution issues. Well, and That's Adam all they should be involved in, but we have given it over to them as you have said, Dave. Yeah, and to jump down a little bit in that boot article, he says this, this pietistic but broadly theologically conservative worldview produces immature believers attending mm -hmm. churches where they can remain unchallenged week after week, calling on God for personal blessing or to increase their faith and obedience, but with little or no conception of the scope and grandeur of the gospel or the transforming power of the kingdom of God for all life. Yet the average congregant has little or no idea how to relate his faith in Christ the Lord, the scriptures and the call to holiness, i.e. to sanctify the life of God to his marriage and family and his children's education, his vocation, various recreational pursuits or civic responsibilities, in short, culture. Salvation, he is told, is for the soul and inner life, while it's the kingdom of God is something that is really coming at the end of the world and so belongs to another age. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, that's, that's the thing. That's what I was fed up with. Oh, yeah. Um, that there was, it's, you know, like that, you know, is this just ritual? <clears throat> is this just a, a check mark coming to church and singing and and maybe making the next check box, you know, like every once in a while, go hang out with some people from church. Um, there was a dichotomy in my life between school and uh, church life. 
and other other things you know everything was its own little <clears throat> own little, its own little order um with you know very little to connect but it didn't i it, it's not that it wasn't satisfying it just didn't make sense <laughs> to me um and i wasn't getting that and uh you know that's why the social gospel was produced um and just like you know he says in that article um infant christians then they get unsatisfied and they go well i think this should be bigger than what you're saying it is. Well, these people are actually doing something and it's providing for some people. There you I'm go. I'm going to go join that. And they yes. don't have the theological prowess to fight against anything. Well, no, 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 no. Love neighbor as yourself. They don't have enough knowledge and they haven't been discipled mm-hmm. enough to go, wait, wait a second. No, love God and love neighbor. <laughs> yes. <laughs> that they, they, well, they, they work together. If you don't have God, then why should I love neighbor? And that's why the social gospel is attractive to many evangelical yeah. pew sitters because yeah. they haven't allowed the gospel to touch every aspect of their life. And because they perpetuated the concept of a secular, secular sacred mentality. And then that creates the issue in which many will go ahead and turn in that same light to well, we, we know there's something wrong with culture. We'll change it through the ballot box. Yeah. That'll, be our, that'll be our hope. Yeah. We'll, we'll overthrow that in the ballot box. So you're never, you know, so that basically you're never going to disciple people and send them to law school. So like, I understand the Reformation, when we look in history, that they were law people that ended up uh, flipping and going into, um, you know, going to become monks or going into ecclesiastical studies and stuff like that. And the thing is, God worked that beautifully because um, that was what was needed at the time. Um, was not more civil people. <laughs> they needed more mm. real biblical people. And now, you know, 500 years later, uh, dang, <laughs> you know, we, we got to now, um, we, we've become so uh, inside ourselves or we're, um, we're too heavenly for any earthly good. <laughs> and so it's the pendulum swings um, the other way. And so we have not produced um, discipled um, city council members mayors, governors, uh, legislation, people, representatives, um, for state or nat or, you know, federal level. Um, we haven't produced those, um, and look what looks where it's gotten us, you know, people are not when there's people with platforms that don't wince that, you know, right up until the baby comes out of a little hole, <laughs> you know, or I'd say big, I, I don't want to discount that, <laughs> but basically whenever the, the kid has to be out to be a person, um, but up yeah. until then you can murder them. You know, that's again, it's, it's not magic. It seems like magic, but that the magic is, is that somehow um, humans um, in their autonomy and their arrogance can go, I can tell you, even though it's arbitrary in development, I can tell you that, nope, that is not human. That is human. And that's not, that's just getting rid of some tissue. And then that would be capital murder in some States yeah, <laughs> over here. Um, but look, look where it's gotten us. And which um, brings us yeah. back to the Missouri Baptist annual meeting as we yeah. sat, as we stood there and saw that resolution ripped apart. Mm-hmm. The first attack was actually not an attack on the resolution, but an attack on God's law. Yeah. And you would say, but wait a second, those are some of the most Christ loving people in the world. Um, I'm going to say very directly. They might be really Christ loving, but they're not Christ understanding. And if yeah. they don't understand them, how can they really love him in a deeper way? Again, whenever, I'm not whenever, trying to be mean or arrogant or yeah. condescending. The problem is they've not allowed the law of God to touch every aspect of their lives. They've created a standard outside of scripture for what's loving and merciful. Yeah. So, you know, so, you know, this brings me back to the, you know, what the committee or the chair or whatever the committee person said, you know, you know, this, uh, this document, you know, if, if it were enforced and like laws were created because of people standing up and representing this, um, that means, um, women can be tried for murder. And he says that like, Ser- do you understand that people, that people can be tried for murder? You want that to happen? And uh, it's like, wait a second. No, 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 no. God's justice. <laughs> for like you're you're siding with somebody that we live in a society 
We know how it works. We know how babies are made. That is science. We are believing science. And all he did was devalue the human yeah. life that existed. Yeah. The mother over all he did the child. was yes, apply an arbitrary standard of what is loving. That's right. Not a biblical standard of what is loving, an arbitrary standard of what is loving, and then sold that emotionally to a group of people who were easily persuaded that that had to be removed. Yeah. And then, uh, you know, so, so again, we, we, we understand that the science behind it, but guess what? That, that person that got an abortion, it's called premeditated. It's like, I don't care what I did. I don't care what the science says. I, I know that this is what produces this, but I'm going to kill it anyway. I'm going to murder But then it. they'll say, Adam, but that poor lady who is, uh, is in a bad circumstance, that poor lady who doesn't have enough money to, to care for a child, that poor lady who's going to be devalued by her um, her family because she had a child out of wedlock. I'm going to say, I'm going to say who doesn't go into court with a, with the idea of a bad circumstance to bring to the judge. Yeah. That's a relative statement. Well, and I'm going to say, <laughs> well, shame on the church. First of yeah. all, shame on her family who put her in a circumstance where they weren't excited that a life was going to enter in the world. Just so you know, every life that enters in the world has some type of inconvenience associated with it. By the way. Yeah. Yeah. And God, even and, the yeah. most excited and welcomed pregnancy has some inconvenience associated with it. Oh yeah. Yeah. First but and the, foremost, by the way, to the mother, part of the curse, by the way, mm -hmm. um, just so we're all reminded that's part of the curse. The fact that there is, uh, discomfort within pregnancy and discomfort within labor. That's part of the curse. That's a reminder of the curse. God's done that to remind us of what the ultimate consequence of breaking his moral standard was. You might say, well, then that's not fair for the woman to have to carry that. Well, guess what? What do you mean by not, not fair? What, yeah. do, what do you mean by it, it, it's not fair? What would have been fair is God to have wiped out Adam and Eve and never given any of us a chance to live. Yeah. But God's yeah. merciful in allowing life to flourish, by the way. Um, yeah. Yeah. And so, you know, it's all this that, you know, all, all the history that gets down to Christ and him, and him on the cross to die for sin so that we can be with him so that we can know him, um, forever and enjoy him forever. Um, and, uh, that, that's why it's there for it's God's purposes is not ours. Um, so basically every time that we try to put ourselves and prop up, uh, prop ourselves up on a pedestal, this is what happens. Um, this is why we're there, but it, it comes down to, um, fully understanding the scriptures, actually being a believer um, in a church <laughs> with, with faithful leaders who are actually Christians and care about their people. And then that's right. And caring about the people they're caring about society as a whole, but they're staying into their limited role that God has called them to. Um, that's but, right. Yeah. That's, that's, that's the, that's the issue that we, we need to look at spheres. We need to look at limitations um, that God has set up. And whenever those are breached, uh, Israel's a great example because whenever the King uh, becomes a priest, he dies. And whenever it's the other way around, they die. God, God has judgment on them, and we're seeing uh, the pendulum swing. Where again, in the Reformation, the church um, was the head of state. Now, the state's going to become the head of the church, and if we allow it, um, we are bringing our own judgment down on us. Just kind of like Israel, um, whenever asked, um, should you know, do you want this man, Jesus, or do you want uh, Barabbas? And they said, give us a Barabbas. Um, and then after that, they said, uh, let the let the his blood be on us and our children. They asked for the blood themselves. They asked for the wrath on their own heads. And it happened. And can it happen again? Am I going to say that this is the end of the world? No, this might be the end of America. But uh, the beautiful thing is, is out of the ashes, God is, will turn everything that's evil, turn it into good for his glory. So we have the gospel hope if we're believing the full gospel. Anyway, we have the full gospel to uh, run head on into what's going on um, in the in the current days that we live in right now. We don't have to go in and despair, but we can go in in victory knowing that it's already won. 
and we're just uh we we need to do what we're called to do that's right yeah so man we have been going for an hour and 10 minutes dave <laughs> well that was a good program and yeah, Adam, let's, uh, I, let's I stick it to that it. one uh one topic <laughs> <laughs> yeah and uh, i knew that that would be yeah. the case with this one i knew that it, we had plenty of of, yeah. of good stuff yeah so uh <laughs> maybe uh next week we can hit up the other the other topic that we we're going to talk about and we'll just say we'll okay. go ahead and do that next week um yeah also, it'll you know, connect really telling. well with us uh getting to him yeah. so yeah yeah so yeah yeah so come back uh next week download next week hopefully next week i'll have the live stream up for anybody that uh travels between the two worlds of uh live stream and uh podcast and youtube just however that works out hopefully i'll have the live stream up um and it works next week um have no clue what's going on but you know god is good um That's right and uh god is in you know he's in control and he um makes things happen so a lot of people still get to listen to this episode uh no matter what um so uh, it's hey awesome. and it's hopefully next week we'll have had a bunch of people on saturday yes who liked and subscribed and got themselves a free plaque yeah uh because of that <laughs> yes that's <laughs> and right put their names in a drawing for yeah. uh rob's book um yeah yeah. Well, guys, um, we're going to end the show. But before uh, we do that, I just want to say uh, thank you for listening and downloading and being a part of Tag Your It um, in that way. Um, if you have any uh, questions, anything that you'd like to um uh, even push back on uh, about any of the uh, stuff that we talked about tonight, please let us know. Uh, we do not, we try not to turn anything away um, if we can get around to it and all that kind of stuff, but definitely questions right. and all that kind of stuff. You know, if um, you know, stuff that we talk about tonight could be fielded um, if you're at the conference on Saturday, but uh, please uh, submit your questions so that maybe we can ask them on Saturday to the uh, panel. So um, we want to know what you want to know um, or need clarity on. So um, please email us, uh, like um, the Tag Your It Facebook page, subscribe to us on uh, YouTube, and send us a review on your favorite podcast app. Um, that greatly helps us, and it's free Always. for you. It's just maybe a few seconds of your time, and we'd be much appreciative of those few seconds of your time uh, to do that. So with that said, this is the Tag Your It Podcast. I'm Ray Ray. And I'm Dave. And Soli. Deo. Gloria. Gloria.